All right, we are back with Dr. Gary Onick. Uh, if you want to hear kind of the first part of this conversation, uh, that'll be linked below. Uh, but in this part, we are going back to about seven years ago and diving into where uh, Dr. Onick's story became uh, more personal than maybe ever expected, as he's worked in the cancer world for 40 years, but all of a sudden it came uh, knocking in a very unique way. Uh, so take us back seven years ago. You get back from this time with your son uh, and time as a, as a sailboat uh, captain and mechanic, and uh, you're now back on the mainland. What happened next? What did that look like? Well, I, uh, I ended up um, in Connecticut um, with, in my boat. With, with Al, my son, mm -hmm. and uh, I was staying at the house of my college roommate. And uh, we were talking about uh, other ways of killing tissue besides IRE. Is there something else we could use? And Carol found a, a way of doing it on a website. It was like an FDA website. And uh, it was a, a way of not punching holes in the cell, but breaking them up. Hmm. And uh, it's called electrical membrane breakdown. Hmm. And so we uh, started uh, working uh, with that. And uh, I realized it was going to be an excellent way of breaking up cells uh, and if we could add the new medications, immunologic medications, and stick the two together, maybe we could get something special to happen. Got and it. Make, okay. Basically, make a, a vaccine mm -hmm. out of the patient's tumor. And so, um, you know, we put in uh, patents back in 2013 on this concept. Uh, and uh, lo and behold, Shortly after that, a couple of years later, a patient came to me and he was uh, dying of prostate cancer. He mm. had maybe six or eight weeks to live. Uh, and uh, he was very sophisticated uh, and his, his son was in the medical industry. And they said, do you have anything? Mm. And I said, well, I have something that I could try. Hmm. Uh, and, uh, so I took the drugs and I took an ablation Now we weren't using the electrical membrane breakdown at the time. I came up with a very special way of, of using freezing okay. for this, um, and, uh, which simulated that we call hmm. it you know, simulated EMB and uh, allowing me to do it before we had the, the optimal way of doing it. And um, I did it. And eight weeks later, he had no cancer. He, he was wow. going to hospice. Mm -hmm. And eight weeks later, he had no cancer. All wow. the tumors went away. His PSA goes to basically zero. And... And this was a, a single treatment? I mean, you did this, yes, this once or is it a treatment. series? Okay. No, it was, it was one treatment. In fact, I had treated him at the hospital and uh, his PSA went down uh, in four weeks so markedly that I wanted to give him another treatment. Hmm. And when I scheduled him for that, the administration of the hospital said, what are you doing? You can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, is PSA well, so too low to do know, a procedure? I'm using, I'm using two things off label. I'm allowed to do that. Right. Uh, and look, it looks like he's responding to it. Yeah. And they said, no, I can't do it. And so I had no way of doing it. The second one. And it, and it just kept going. And he went to zero. Wow. And he has been um, free of disease ever since. 
Wow. And so, uh, so what, what's the mechanism that you think, if we get into the science a little bit, what's the mechanism of action for that combination? Yeah. Well, the, uh, let's go, let's just talk briefly about what they use now okay. in terms of immunotherapy. Uh, Immunotherapy, the main drugs for immunotherapy are called checkpoint inhibitors. Okay. So tumors have these proteins that bind to your lymphocytes and turn your lymphocytes off. And there are a couple of those. The two, well, there are numerous ones, but the two that there are drugs for, one is CTLA-4. And the other is PD-1. Okay. Uh, and so uh, the checkpoint inhibitors basically are a protein and an immunoglobulin that binds to the CTLA-4 and the PD-1 on the tumor okay. and frees the lymphocyte to recognize the tumor. Okay. So, and this won the Nobel Prize for medicine, uh, the discovery of this checkpoint, mm -hmm. uh, these checkpoints. And so, uh, the idea, uh, so these checkpoint inhibitors are now used intravenously. What they did was they said, okay, well, let's give them, you know, into the vein and, and, um, uh, you know, hopefully it'll get to the tumor and, mm -hmm. um, it'll It'll be a major advance. And it was a major advance. Do it, it's, yeah. But, but the problem is that because you're giving this, these drugs, these very powerful drugs, uh, IV, and you're exposing the whole body to them, your body can recognize normal tissues as abnormal. Hmm. So every tissue in, in the body has been shown to be um, affected with major complications at various times Got it. with this. So that's one aspect. The other aspect is that it was, it, certain tumors didn't, don't respond to that. Mm -hmm. So for instance, the, the first cancer they, they did, uh, the first one they did was melanoma and melanoma proved that, you know, it got, got better. Uh, then they said, okay, we, now we've got melanoma, so let's do the other ones, the ones that we really would love to do, like prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. A zillion prostate cancer cases, let's do prostate cancer. Prostate cancer, no response. Hmm. Huge study. Okay. Huge yep. studies didn't work. Uh, and so uh, pancreas, pancre pancreatic cancer, huge study, didn't work. Hmm. And any number of other, and these are called cold tumors. So knowing that if I had given that patient systemic immunotherapy, he would have died anyway. Right. Nothing would have happened. So uh, what the difference in what we are doing is we are basically saying if we put everything that you need for the immune system to react to this patient's cancer at the same place, at the same time, when those cells come there that are going to kill the cancer and train the rest of your cells to go yep. everywhere to kill your cancer, that's called the epscopal effect. Mm -hmm. uh, if we put it all right there, simultaneously perhaps we'll be able to get this reaction going where previously it wasn't and mm. what it clearly with out, patient zero patient zero uh what we basically were doing and, and are doing is we're creating now a vaccine of your mm -hmm. own cancer so that your body recognizes it mm -hmm. and They've tried, they're taking tumors out and they're processing them and putting antigens back in. Uh, uh, there are lots of projects like that, but it's, you know, limited to the antigens that you want to, you know, that you're giving back. 
Right. Very expensive, very time consuming, and uh, didn't doesn't appear to work all that well. Yeah. So we just um, it, it's uh, you know if I dislocate my shoulder, patting myself on the back here. It was a very uh, simple and elegant way of solving the mm. problem. And uh, patient zero, wow, unbelievable. Now, if God wanted to tell you to keep working at a project, he'd give you the results of patient zero, wouldn't he? I mean, he could Feels have, logical. Yeah, I mean, we could have failed in the first three patients, and this project never would have happened. And then be done. Yeah, yeah done. you're right. Yeah, um, probably wouldn't have taken that. Would have taken two, mm-hmm. and it would have failed. But when you give us this example uh, so dramatically, what you say is, "This is a message," mm. and. We've got to keep doing this. We've got to keep learning, and we've got to we've got to make this happen. Because if we can make it happen, we are going to save tens of thousands of lives, and uh, and change the world of immunotherapy. Hmm. Because you know this is a platform technology. You can, I mean, we're using these drugs that are available, but um, there are other checkpoint inhibitors coming down the line, and nothing says we can't plug those into our right. system yeah, yeah, yeah. and make those checkpoint inhibitors work better. Because right now they're testing other checkpoint inhibitors and some of them are, ah, the results are kind of, you know, you wouldn't jump up and down about them. And, right. and I know that we can make those work. Yeah. So uh, that's where we are uh, right now. Yeah. Um, the so, so what, what was the what was the second time God came knocking uh, on this project? Because I think that's <laughs> yeah, it's a really interesting part of this story. <laughs> well, yeah, because this this took this project in, a, in an interesting direction. Yeah. So um, I had trouble urinating, and um, as a doctor dealing with prostate cancer, what was I going to do but ignore all of my symptoms? Right. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Yeah. Never Toddlers, get a kids thing. have never no get shoes. A, yeah. Never get yeah, a yeah, yeah. Ignore all your systems, uh, symptoms of course. because, and you know, I was backed up by literature that said, "Oh, don't get PSAs anymore. You know, all you're going to do is find cancer that doesn't matter, right?" So, um, yeah. yeah. So I, I, and you know, it fit with the way I wanted to do things, uh, so <laughs> so I did that, yeah. and uh, so I was having trouble urinating, and um, I was going for a scan to find out how big the prostate was because you know, how was I going to, cause it was, I figured this is benign prostatic hypertrophy. The sure. reason why old guys like me can't pee. Sure. And so I, um, I went for this scan and because I'm a radiologist and I know that I'm watching the scans come up with the, with the radiologist to center. And, um, uh, I'm looking at him going, this is really bad. Oh, I can see uh, tumors. Excuse me. I can see tumors in my bones. Hmm. I've got a big mass in my pelvis from a, that tumor that had grown. It's pushing my bladder to the side. I had lymph nodes enlarged everywhere. And, um, you know, I looked at this and I said, you're going to die. Wow, you know the, you, this is a this is a hundred percent fatal, and I hadn't seen a, a presentation kind of like mine uh, ever, and so I, wow. I yeah, so I was, you know you're going to die, and and uh, it's a lot to process on the the scan I, table. Well, it, it was, it was, and you know your stomach hits the floor, and you, uh, yeah, but I. Um, very quickly uh, made peace with it. it took me mm. about a day mm. to make peace with it. Um, I had my faith by then. Mm. Um, and um, I said, well, you're going to handle it. 
um, as best you can. And uh, the question was, what was I was I going to treat myself? Or was I going to get any treatment? Because the treatment for what I had is castration, right? You know, either chemical or actual castration. And um, I said, "Yeah, that's not for me, really." Hmm. I mean, I I love working out. I love, yeah, I love women. I you know, one particular one now. So if, if she ever sees this, she knows that I'm not out there. <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> that's good. Good clarification, yeah. Uh, yeah. honey. Just, just you. you. <laughs> just you. Just you. And uh, so I. Uh, I said, that's not just not for me. I'm going to die with mm. dignity. Uh, but I really did have something. I had two things. I had prayer, which I knew through my experience with patients, um, could cure somebody. Mm. I mean, I've seen instances of it. Uh, and so I could do, I could employ that, but I could also employ my own treatment, my immunologic treatment that already had saved, uh, you know, a number of lives of my patients. Hmm. And so I, I decided I was going to combine the two. And, uh, you know, the first thing I had to do was get a lot of people to pray for me. And so I decided I'm going to make a video and I'm going to, go around and I'm going to tell this story and say, okay, and now I've got cancer. I pray. So, yeah. uh, in three weeks, I traveled around the country. Uh, I found a wonderful production company, a uh, faith-based production company that, uh, took it on as really a mission. Mm. And, um, uh, you know, we traveled together and, and did it all. Uh, they did an amazing job in, in another three weeks. They cut and pasted the whole thing and got, it. I mean, uh, I don't think there was ever anything produced that quickly. Wow. Um, uh, and so, and I sent it out to everybody and said, Hey, pray for me. Hmm. The other aspect was I needed to get my treatment done. But the problem yeah. with that treatment is that, it does require a procedure. Mm -hmm. And just like any procedure, there is a lot of, there are a lot of nuances to it. I mean, somebody looking at me doing it can go, oh, yeah, I can do it. stick the probe in, freeze a little bit, inject the drug, yeah, it's over, right? Um, no problem. Right. It's right, right. not like that. It's like watching somebody fix a car. You go, eh, I could do that. It's not such a big deal. You know, right. and then you're, then you try when the mechanics it. passed out on the table. That's right. And then <laughs> you can't you, ask questions. And then, and then you try it and you've always got 10 screws left, you know, right. and yeah. you're done. So, um, so I, uh, I needed to somehow get this done. And mm. I contacted an old friend of mine, uh, who I had done a lot of, uh, prostate cryo surgery with, and I had trained mm. him to do prostate cryo surgery and I knew he could he could do the procedure if I was able to guide him to do it. Yeah. And so I said, you know, I'll be awake and I'll guide you through the procedure. I'll have a spinal and, and we'll do it together. And, um, his comment was, are you out of your mind? <laughs> you, you can't, you can't, <laughs> you can't do that. Yeah. And, uh, I said, sure we can, you know, it'll be an adventure. And, uh, so we, we had the production company, uh, film mm -hmm. that, uh, it wasn't part of the, well, we were able to put a portion of it in the first, uh, video because mm -hmm. it had happened, uh, uh, you know, kind of staggered, but, but we had enough of it done that when, when the production was going on, we were able to stick some of that in there. Right. Um, and, uh, so, um, we did it and, uh, and I couldn't urinate at all by that time. 
Mm. Um, I had to use what we call self catheter. So uh, five times a day, I had to put a catheter in my bladder uh, myself to empty the urine. I also had uh, a bone med in my hip that was just killing me mm. that I needed to take uh, you know, narcotics for. And so um, we did it. And two weeks later, my hip pain was gone. I'm going. Interesting. Interesting. You know, this is interesting. And uh, then uh, about four weeks after that, you know, I start to be able to urinate a little bit. And at six weeks, I don't have to do any cat self catheterization. So I'm urinating normally. Wow. And uh, I then get a repeat of my scan, and all the cancer is gone. Wow. All of it. All of it. All the cancer is gone. And my PSA um, was down to. To below one to normal. from 137 to below one that's insane that, yes it was and so how do you how do you put this in perspective hmm. um, well obviously I was given a miracle hmm. because I'm the only, I mean, imagine you are the only person in the world that can produce this result for somebody and you do it on yourself and you get the result. And get that result, yeah. And get the result. What are the chances of that? Yeah. Now, now real quick, were you patient too? Like no. essentially you did it on the one or you had done it on a number of people? No, I had done it on a number okay. of people. Okay. And I knew that it was, I knew that it was reproducible by then. Mm -hmm. uh, I still wasn't telling anybody about it uh, because it, it's, it's so disruptive to so many mm. vested interests and, and to the way things are being done that I really had to prove to myself uh, that uh, this was reproducible so um yeah uh, so i got that result and uh, what was clear was that uh, i was talking to to al when i first found out and mm -hmm. and um you know my kids i brought them all to pittsburgh and i said okay this is what i got you know and uh, my my daughter you know, burst into tears. And hmm. my son, Casey, who's a doctor, uh, you know, basically said, dad, you can't even die in the usual way. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And then, and Al said, uh, you know, he looked at me and in his own, you know, somewhat deadpan way said, hmm. you know, dad, I'm crushed. Hmm. And, uh, you know, I said, Al, you know, there's no reason to be mm. crushed because we know how this is going to turn out. This is being done so we can prove a point hmm. so that we can show. So you just had that much confidence in where I this had was that, heading. I had that much confidence. I, I just, I said, there's, there is no other reason that I could be placed in this situation hmm. than to prove this point that this works. But interestingly, you know, I'm talking now so much about uh, prayer and healing and you know, the spiritual aspects. You know, there's a part of me that says, you know, was this part of that plan too? I mean, was mm -hmm. this uh, something I was supposed to talk about? Because I've got a unique perspective. Number one, I've been mm -hmm. given a miracle. But number two, I was an atheist. Mm -hmm. I was a scientifically based atheist. That's what we were trained. If you can't see it, smell it, touch it, feel it, measure it, then it mm -hmm. doesn't exist. Sure. And that's why so many scientists are 
you know, not connected in a spiritual way anymore. And uh, I learned uh, through quantum physics that there was a basis for uh, the s- spiritual aspects of mm. of lives. You don't can't prove it, but I, now I knew that there was an underpinning for it, and that mm. um, gave me as a scientist a way to hang, you know, my spirituality yeah. on something yeah. that I could base it on. Yeah, that, that's interesting. I, I think it is really unfortunate that in today's society, um, the word faith, I think, means something different than uh, at least many people who have faith intend to use it. You know, it's kind of used as like this, you either have faith or you have science or, or faith is in opposition or, or faith is blind. You're rejecting exactly. reality for a fairy tale. It's kind of how it's it's markered. That's- yeah. Uh, and and that was never the intention, I don't think, at least for many religions, for, for our religion, for Christianity. Now, that's my, my wife and I, our, our background and our, and our faith. That's never the intention of the word faith. You know, faith is um, hope in things I can't see but have evidence to believe, right? So, yeah. so I go, I, there is evidence for me to reasonably believe that this is true even if I can't see it, if things are historical that we're talking about or – Things like miracles, you know, things like I I can't explain how this healing happened. It was a death sentence. And yet you go, okay, I I believe in something I can't see, but have evidence to to believe in. And now science through uh, quantum physics Mm -hmm. is is showing us how all of this can happen. Yeah, that's interesting. And and there are. Good scientific studies showing how your consciousness affects things mm. and how healing can happen, and and scientific studies showing that your consciousness and others' consciousness can heal things. So I mean, these were done in good places, Princeton, yeah, Stanford, and so uh, nobody knows them; uh, they're not advertised. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, it's, it's all there. And yeah. And so I think we're in a, this incredibly exciting time where, where science and spirituality are coming together Hmm. and uh, one is supporting the other. And so, uh, I don't know, maybe that was part of what I was supposed to say in this whole thing Hmm. besides, curing cancer um i don't know uh it seems awfully suspicious to me (laughs) yeah yeah it is interesting yeah i i imagine we you know we we haven't talked about it but i imagine we are probably of different faiths or or we would define our faiths differently jewish okay um but i think what at least what i see is that um God has made us in such a way that there is this deep connection between our our thoughts and and our and our mind and our hearts and emotion and our bodies that this this connection that's that's built in and our connection with each other um, is powerful and isn't it is something um, I guess native to humanity. I've yeah, got it. Go for I'm it. Gonna, I'm going to throw this one by you. It's Let's hear. Off. It's a little out there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always, and, always and happy to discuss understand. ideas am, and disagree together. I'm good with that. I am not it. a theologian, and uh, my training that way is 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 meager at mm. best. But uh, sometimes uh, my ignorance has been my strongest strength, actually. Mm. I didn't know what was there, so I could go, ah, well, uh, let's do it this way. Mm-hmm. Where everybody else said, you can't do it that way. So this is my my thought because you've just okay. said you've just made a seminal point, which is that miracles and 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 to prayer happen across faiths. It's it's a you know I, it's a universal thing. It's not just for you know one uh, religion, and there's even secular prayer. This this idea of the secret where you put your intentions out there. Mm, and yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and these things happen to you. Yep. That the, the universe, the, the universe, universe is a is an is a force 
that acts. Yeah. yeah. And, and so, you know, these people don't like to say God and, mm-hmm. uh, but you know, they'll, they'll allow that thought mm-hmm. to, to bring them to the idea that, you know, their consciousness can affect things. Yeah. Uh, so this is my, this is, my, so, so a lot of people have trouble with prayer doing things because they said, are you telling me God is listening to everybody's prayer? Mm. That just doesn't, that doesn't wash for me. Uh, I'm not saying me, I'm talking about those. Sure. So, uh, well, sure. I mean, it's God. He can, he can listen to everybody's prayers, but, um, you know, maybe it's that God has put this system in place that allows prayers to get their result. Hmm. Meaning he doesn't have to listen to everyone, but he's put the system in place to allow these things to happen. And it's very much like if, uh, you know, you look at the CEO of a cell phone company, you know, does the CEO of Verizon route all your, your, you know, your calls? No, he put this system in place Mm -hmm. so that when you make your call, it, you know, goes to the person you're calling. Mm-hmm. He doesn't have to, but without him, you know, nobody's talking to anybody. And so that's kind of the way I'm thinking about this now, hmm. because yeah, I had, that's interesting. I had the same situation as you. I, I said, you know, I, I know that other people of other faiths pray and they get results too. And, mm. um, so how does, how does that work? So anyway, so that's, that's that's Friday's uh, thinking on this. Monday they'll sure. be another thought, but sure. Uh, no, it. <laughs> it's it's really interesting. And, and I've been thinking about that for a couple of weeks now. Yeah, because um, I've been asked about it, and so yeah. Anyway, yeah, I mean, so so um, we like I said, I feel like have a we try to have a very reasonable faith. You know, so when we talk about that, that there is reason and there is evidence behind what we believe and and why we believe it, and so um, I think. It doesn't, it doesn't challenge me. It, it doesn't, it's not a, a question I can't answer when other faiths and other belief systems seem to have results that are, that, that are, um, seemingly miraculous, whether yeah. it's, you know, if you've read, um, uh, a book, Radical Remission by Dr. Kelly Turner, she, she talks about, she's a researcher and talks about, um, these cases of people who were on death's door, uh, with, with their cancer and, um, through different means, uh, various means, many different means, uh, overcome their cancer and and are healed to go into radical remission Mm -hmm. unexpected. There's no explanation scientifically for it. Um, and one of the, the key factors she identified was a, a spiritual connection or spiritual driver. Um, and so, Again, I think, you know, so in, in my framework and my, my belief system, I would call that maybe common grace. I don't know if that's a term that you're, you're familiar with, but that God, you know, provides a common grace to everybody. The fact that we're all breathing, right? You don't have to be a Christian to breathe. You don't have to be a Jew to breathe. Everybody breathes. Everybody has oxygen. Everybody has life and and blessings and rain falls on the just and the unjust and kind of all of it. Uh, That that is, is an aspect of common grace. And I think our connection with our bodies and the way we think and that people who are more stressed, you know, get, have heart attacks <laughs> and people yep. who are like th- those things are such a clear to me, uh, indicator of a connection. That's just a part of the human experience. And, so it's, just, uh, it's interesting to me. Well, my, my journey is my spiritual journey is, is young hmm. compared to most people because I started it really um, probably, you know, 10 years ago, maybe mm. 12 years ago. So, um, I, you know, th- that's, so I'm, I'm very, very young in this and uh, I'm still exploring things and figuring things out and see, seeing where I, you know, where I land. Hmm. And, um, I have no idea where I'm landing, <laughs> <laughs> sure. but it's going to be a great place. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, it, it is interesting. It's, I, I feel like it's only scientists who start with a, a rejection of 
the concept of God that that come to conclusions that there can't be a God. If that makes sense. Where, where you start with a bias of like, I I assume there is no God. So now I'm looking at, at data and, and everything through that lens of there is no God. And so then I come to conclusions that, you know, kind of support that that hypothesis. Oh, yeah. hypothesis and you ignore and you you ignore all other Yeah, uh, exactly. Exactly. It's very much it's very much like medicine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's it's interesting people's like people's biases that they're not even aware of. So science uh, and uh, whether that's medical science or, or any field of science does not um, challenge or, or cause me to question my faith, but it just further bolsters it and and, and, and supports and, it and as it we should. look at things. And it yeah. should. Uh, yeah. That's where I'm coming from now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's that's cool. Well, okay. uh, thank you for for taking that detour with me. Uh, it, it's one I find very interesting. Um, and so this was coming back to the story. So uh, what did it look like after you had that first scan that showed cancer is gone? What what is a journey of your health look like since then? Um, I have stayed gone. Been, no, I've just been I've stayed gone. I just yeah. I have. Um, you know, I have no evidence of metastatic disease, three hmm. years now, just finished wow. my three year anniversary. And um, I assume I'm going to continue that way. I don't take it for granted. Mm-hmm. Um, I know that I've been given this time to do this project. I, hmm. I often look up and say, you know, don't hold it against me if I enjoy myself every once in a while. <laughs> I'm totally dedicated to this project. Uh, but I Just know might go sailing that, every once in a while. Yeah, so I know that's why I've been given, hmm. um, you know, this chance. And so, um, you know, we're working the, um, as hard as we can work to get hmm. this, you know, uh, pat, over the finish line for at least one indication. And we've got an FDA study that's uh, started. Um, looking for more funding to, to bring cool. that off. And mm-hmm. so um, we're getting there. We're getting there. That's, that's exciting. And uh, a very unique story that I appreciate you, you sharing with us. Thank you very much.